Hi, my name's Dennis Duncan. I'm a lecturer in English Literature at University College London, and I'm the author of a book called Index, A History of the... I became in interested in indexes because I was working on uh, literature. I was working on a group of avant-garde writers um, from Paris from the second half of the 20th century, a group called the Oulipo. And it struck me that uh, a number of members of this group had written novels that have uh, indexes, which is unusual. We know novels don't ordinarily have indexes. One of them, uh, a novel by a chap called Georges Perec, um, in English it's called Life, a User's Manual, has, I think, multiple indexes. There's another novel by a man called Harry Matthews, another member of this group, called The Sinking of the Odradec Stadium. That has an index. And I was thinking, that's funny, why are members of this group playing with the index for novels? There's a few others. Virginia Woolf's Orlando has an index. Lewis Carroll has a novel with an index. But mostly we know the rule, non-fiction has an index, fiction doesn't. So I thought, well, I ought to um, maybe write an article on why members of this group are interested in playing with that dividing line, novels with indexes. So the first thing I did was I thought, well, where's the standard history of the index? Because I need to know a bit about this. And it turned out there wasn't one. Uh, <laughs> and I thought, right, well, we need this. Uh, so I settled down to, uh, to fill that gap. Uh, the book index was invented um, twice, uh, around about the same time, around about the year 1230. One of those inventions, a bit like the light bulb or a bit like mathematical calculus that people needed at a particular moment. So it gets invented twice uh, uh, by two different um, people. Um, it gets invented in Paris and it gets invented in Oxford. And they're two subtly different versions of the same thing. The index as it was invented in Paris is the word-for-word -word index, what we call the concordance, which is where you take a text, in this case the Bible, and you basically uh, uh, break it down into its individual words and then you put them in alphabetical order. And anyone who's looking for such and such a word, you just look it up in the table. This is kind of the way that a search engine works, or kind of the way if you're uh, jumping through a document using control F, you're using that type of concordance search. The other type of index, which was invented by a man called Robert Grosstess in Oxford around about 1230, is what we call the subject index. And this is a kind of reader-oriented index where somebody notes an idea in a text and says, OK, the, the idea of the Trinity, that occurs here. Make a note of where that is. And the themes or topics or ideas or subjects of a text, their positions are noted. So instead of being a word-for-word -word index, it's a more kind of conceptual index. This is the kind of thing we're used to at the back of books. I'll give you an example of the story of the prodigal son in the Bible, the most famous story in the Bible, most famous story of forgiveness or mercy. Now, it doesn't contain the word forgiveness. It doesn't contain the word mercy, either in the English or the Latin. It doesn't contain the word prodigal either. So if you're using a word-for-word -word index, a concordance, you're out of luck. You're not going to find it there. But if you're using a subject index, where an indexer has decided what are the themes that somebody might be looking for when they use this text, then it's more likely to say, ah, forgiveness, are you thinking of Luke and the prodigal son? Um, one of the things that I discovered is, is that actually indexes seem such a kind of innocuous or even a kind of sensible, uh, quiet device at the back of a book. Um, but their history is quite a, a kind of gnarly one, full of snark and scandal, um, full of heretics and disgraced politicians. What we find as people um, become familiar with the technology, once people know how to use it, um, you can start to um, abuse it. In this little book, the novel called The Man of Feeling, the editor, Henry Morley, so a Victorian um, professor of English literature, he has a problem with the sentimentality of this novel. People keep bursting into tears. So in his editor's introduction, at the end of it, he compiles an index to tears. This is a two-page index of all of the 40 or 50 moments in this tiny little book where people keep bursting into tears. Tears, choked utterance, moistened eye, page 141. Do you weep again? Page 53. Tears burst into sobbing and shedding. Um, sweet girl, here she wept, hand wet by tear just fallen, and so on, and so on, and so on. The thing that I've learned is the importance of the figure of the indexer. This 800-year history of um, the reader who goes before us, who does the work, who thinks, how are future readers going to, to read this book? What's going to be useful to them? 
I found a, a kind of profoundly moving one. Uh, something that came into focus towards the end of writing this for me was that I wanted the book to be a kind of paean to um, these overlooked, unknown, almost always anonymous figures who've enabled us to use books in ways that we wouldn't ordinarily be able to, ways that we can't if we have to read everything from start to finish.